Section 4 Division of Labour in Manufacture and Division of Labour in Society We first considered the origin of manufacture, then its simple elements, then the detail labourer and his implements, and finally the totality of the mechanism. We shall now lightly touch upon the relation between the division of labour in manufacture and the social division of labour, which forms the foundation of all production of commodities. If we keep labour alone in view, we may designate the separation of social production into its main divisions or genera, viz. agriculture, industries, etc., as division of labour in general, and the splitting up of these families into species and subspecies, as division of labour in particular, and the division of labour within the workshop as division of labour in singular or in detail. Footnote. Division of labour proceeds from the separation of professions the most widely different to that division, where several labourers divide between them the preparation of one and the same product, as in manufacture. Storch. Cour d'économie politique. Among peoples which have reached a certain level of civilization, we meet with three kinds of division of labour. The first, which we shall call general, brings about the division of the producers into agriculturalists, manufacturers and traders. It corresponds to the three main branches of the nation's labour. The second, which one could call particular, is the division of labour of each branch into species. The third division of labour, which one could designate as a division of tasks, or of labour properly so called, is that which grows up in the individual crafts and trades, which is established in the majority of the manufactories and workshops. Scarbeck. End of footnote. Division of labour in a society and the corresponding tying down of individuals to a particular calling develops itself just as does the division of labour in manufacture from opposite starting points. Within a family, and after further development within a tribe, there springs up naturally a division of labour, caused by differences of sex and age, a division that is consequently based on purely physiological foundation, which division enlarges its materials by the expansion of the community, by the increase of population, and more especially by the conflicts between different tribes and the subjugation of one tribe by another. Footnote. Note to the third edition. Subsequent very searching study of the primitive condition of man led the author to the conclusion that it was not the family that originally developed into the tribe, but that, on the contrary, the tribe was the primitive and spontaneously developed form of human association, on the basis of blood relationship, and that out of the first incipient loosening of the tribal bonds, the many and various forms of the family were afterwards developed. Friedrich Engels. End of footnote. On the other hand, as I have before remarked, the exchange of products springs up at the points where different families, tribes, communities come in contact. For in the beginning of civilization, it is not private individuals, but families, tribes, etc., that meet on an independent footing. Different communities find different means of production and different means of subsistence in their natural environment. Hence, their modes of production and of living and their products are different. It is this spontaneously developed difference which, when different communities come in contact, calls forth the mutual exchange of products and the consequent gradual conversion of those products into commodities. Exchange does not create the differences between the spheres of production, but brings what are already different into relation and thus converts them into more or less interdependent branches of the collective production of an enlarged society. In the latter case, the social division of labour arises from the exchange between spheres of production that are originally distinct and independent of one another. In the former, 
where the physiological division of labour is the starting point, the particular organs of a compact whole grow loose and break off, principally owing to the exchange of commodities with foreign communities, and then isolate themselves so far that the sole bond, still connecting the various kinds of work, is the exchange of the products as commodities. In the one case, it is the making dependent what was before independent. In the other case, the making independent what was before dependent. The foundation of every division of labour that is well developed and brought about by the exchange of commodities is the separation between town and country. Footnote Sir James Stewart is the economist who has handled this subject best. How little his book, which appeared ten years before The Wealth of Nations, is known, even at the present time, may be judged from the fact that the admirers of Malthus do not even know that the first edition of the latter's work on population contains, except in the purely declamatory part, very little but extracts from Stuart, and in a less degree from Wallace and Townsend. End of footnote. It may be said that the whole economic history of society is summed up in the movement of this antithesis. We pass it over, however, for the present. Just as a certain number of simultaneously employed labourers are the material prerequisites for division of labour in manufacture, so are the number and density of the population, which here correspond to the agglomeration in one workshop, a necessary condition for the division of labour in society. Footnote. There is a certain density of population which is convenient both for social intercourse and for that combination of powers by which the produce of labour is increased. James Mill As the number of labourers increases, the productive power of society augments in the compound ratio of that increase multiplied by the effects of the division of labour. Thomas Hodgkin End of footnote Nevertheless, this density is more or less relative. A relatively thinly populated country with well-developed means of communication has a denser population than a more numerously populated country with badly developed means of communication. And in this sense, the northern states of the American Union, for instance, are more thickly populated than India. Footnote In consequence of the great demand for cotton after 1861, the production of cotton in some thickly populated districts of India was extended at the expense of rice cultivation. In consequence, there arose local famines, the defective means of communication not permitting the failure of rice in one district to be compensated by importation from another. End of footnote. Since the production and the circulation of commodities are the general prerequisites of the capitalist mode of production, division of labour in manufacture demands that division of labour in society at large should previously have attained a certain degree of development. Inversely, the former division reacts upon and develops and multiplies the latter. Simultaneously, with the differentiation of the instruments of labour, the industries that produce these instruments become more and more differentiated. Footnote. Thus the fabrication of shuttles formed as early as the 17th century, a special branch of industry in Holland. End of footnote. If the manufacturing system sees upon an industry which previously was carried on in connection with others, either as a chief or as a subordinate industry, and by one producer, these industries immediately separate their connection and become independent. If it sees upon a particular stage in the production of a commodity, the other stages of its production become converted into so many independent industries. It has already been stated 
that where the finished article consists merely of a number of parts fitted together, the detail operations may re-establish themselves as genuine and separate handicrafts. In order to carry out more perfectly the division of labour in manufacture, a single branch of production is, according to the varieties of its raw material or the various forms that one and the same raw material may assume, split up into numerous and to some extent entirely new manufactures. Accordingly, in France alone, in the first half of the eighteenth century, over one hundred different kinds of silk stuffs were woven, and in Avignon it was law that every apprentice should devote himself to only one sort of fabrication, and should not learn the preparation of several kinds of stuff at once. The territorial division of labour which confines special branches of production to special districts of a country acquires fresh stimulus from the manufacturing system, which exploits every special advantage. Footnote. Whether the woollen manufacture of England is not divided into several parts or branches appropriated to particular places, where they are only or principally manufactured. Fine cloths in Somersetshire, coarse in Yorkshire, long ells at Exeter, soise at Sudbury, crepes at Norwich, Lindsay's at Kendal, blankets at Whitney, and so forth. Barclay, the Queerest, 1751, end of footnote. The colonial system and the opening out of the markets of the world, both of which are included in the general conditions of existence of the manufacturing period, furnish rich material for developing the division of labour in society. It is not the place here to go on to show how division of labour seizes upon not only the economic, but every other sphere of society, and everywhere lays the foundation of that all-engrossing system of specialising and sorting men, that development in a man of one single faculty at the expense of all other faculties, which caused A. Ferguson, the master of Adam Smith, to exclaim, We make a nation of helots, and have no free citizens. Footnote. A. Ferguson, History of Civil Society, Edinburgh, 1767. End of footnote. But in spite of the numerous analogies and links connecting them, division of labour in the interior of a society, and that in the interior of a workshop, differ not only in degree, but also in kind. The analogy appears most indisputable where there is an invisible bond uniting the various branches of trade. For instance, the cattle breeder produces hides, the tanner makes the hides into leather, and the shoemaker the leather into boots. Here the thing produced by each of them is but a step towards the final form, which is the product of all their labours combined. There are, besides, all the various industries that supply the cattle breeder, the tanner, and the shoemaker with the means of production. Now it is quite possible to imagine, with Adam Smith, that the difference between the above social division of labour and the division in manufacture is merely subjective, exists merely for the observer, who, in a manufacture, can see with one glance all the numerous operations being performed on one spot, while in the instance given above the spreading out of the work over great areas and the great number of people employed in each branch of labour obscure the connection. Footnote. In manufacture proper, he says, the division of labour appears to be greater because those employed in every different branch of the work can often be collected into the same workhouse and placed at once under the view of the spectator. In those great manufactures, on the contrary, which are destined to supply the great wants of the great body of the people, every different branch of the work employs so great a number of workmen that it is impossible to collect them all into the same workhouse. The division is not near so obvious. A. Smith, Wealth of Nations The celebrated passage in the same chapter that begins with the words, Observe the accommodation of the most common artificer or day-labourer in a civilised and thriving country, etc., 
and then proceeds to depict what an enormous number and variety of industries contribute to the satisfaction of the wants of an ordinary labourer, is copied almost word for word from B. de Mandeville's remarks to his Fable of the Bees, or Private Vices, Public Benefits, 1714, end of footnote. But what is it that forms the bond between the independent labours of the cattle breeder, the tanner, and the shoemaker? It is the fact that their respective products are commodities. What, on the other hand, characterises division of labour in manufactures? The fact that the detail labourer produces no commodities. Footnote. There is no longer anything which we can call the natural reward of individual labour. Each labourer produces only some part of a whole, and each part having no value or utility in itself, there is nothing on which the labourer can seize and say, It is my product. This I will keep to myself. Labour defended against the claims of capital, 1825. The author of this admirable work is the Thomas Hodgskin I have already cited. End of footnote. It is only the common product of all the detail labourers that becomes a commodity. Footnote. This distinction between division of labour in society and in manufacture was practically illustrated to the Yankees. One of the new taxes devised at Washington during the Civil War was the duty of 6% on all industrial products. Question. What is an industrial product? Answer of the legislature. A thing is produced when it is made, and it is made when it is ready for sale. Now, for one example out of many, the New York and Philadelphia manufacturers had previously been in the habit of making umbrellas with all their belongings. But since an umbrella is a mixtum compositum of very heterogeneous parts, by degrees these parts became the products of various separate industries carried on independently in different places. They entered as separate commodities into the umbrella manufactory, where they were fitted together. The Yankees have given to articles thus fitted together the name of assembled articles, a name they deserve for being an assemblage of taxes. Thus the umbrella assembles first 6% on the price of each of its elements, and a further 6% on its own total price. End of footnote. Division of labour in society is brought about by the purchase and sale of the products of different branches of industry, while the connection between the detail operations in a workshop is due to the sale of the labour power of several workmen to one capitalist, who applies it as combined labour power. The division of labour in the workshop implies concentration of the means of production in the hands of one capitalist. The division of labour in society implies their dispersion among many independent producers of commodities. While within the workshop the iron law of proportionality subjects definite numbers of workmen to definite functions, in the society outside the workshop, chance and caprice have full play in distributing the producers and their means of production among the various branches of industry. The different spheres of production, it is true, constantly tend to an equilibrium, for, on the one hand, while each producer of a commodity is bound to produce a use-value to satisfy a particular social want, and while the extent of these wants differs quantitatively, still there exists an inner relation which settles their proportions into a regular system, and that system one of spontaneous growth. And on the other hand, the law of the value of commodities ultimately determines how much of its disposable working time society can expend on each particular class of commodities. But this constant tendency to equilibrium of the various spheres of production is exercised only in the shape of a reaction against the constant upsetting of this equilibrium. The a priori system on which the division of labour within the workshop is regularly carried out becomes in the division of labour within the society 
an a posteriori, nature-imposed necessity, controlling the lawless caprice of the producers and perceptible in the barometrical fluctuations of the market prices. Division of labour within the workshop implies the undisputed authority of the capitalist over men, that are but parts of a mechanism that belongs to him. The division of labour within the society brings into contact independent commodity producers who acknowledge no other authority but that of competition, of the coercion exerted by the pressure of their mutual interests. Just as in the animal kingdom, the bellum omnium contra omnes, war of all against all, Hobbes, more or less preserves the conditions of existence of every species. The same bourgeois mind which praises division of labour in the workshop, lifelong annexation of the labourer to a partial operation, and his complete subjection to capital as being an organisation of labour that increases its productiveness, that same bourgeois mind denounces with equal vigour every conscious attempt to socially control and regulate the process of production as an inroad upon such sacred things as the rights of property, freedom and unrestricted play for the bent of the individual capitalist. It is very characteristic that the enthusiastic apologists of the factory system have nothing more damning to urge against a general organisation of the labour of society than that it would turn all society into one immense factory. If, in a society with capitalist production, anarchy in the social division of labour and despotism in that of the workshop are mutual conditions the one of the other, we find, on the contrary, in those earlier forms of society in which the separation of trades has been spontaneously developed, then crystallised and finally made permanent by law, on the one hand, a specimen of the organisation of the labour of society in accordance with an approved and authoritative plan, and on the other, the entire exclusion of division of labour in the workshop, or at all events a mere dwarf-like or sporadic and accidental development of the same. Footnote. It can be laid down as a general rule that the less authority presides over the division of labour inside society, the more the division of labour develops inside the workshop, and the more it is subjected there to the authority of a single person. Thus, authority in the workshop and authority in society in relation to the division of labour are in inverse ratio to each other. Karl Marx, Misère, etc. End of footnote. Those small and extremely ancient Indian communities, some of which have continued down to this day, are based on possession in common of the land, on the blending of agriculture and handicrafts, and on an unalterable division of labour, which serves whenever a new community is started as a plan and scheme ready cut and dried. Occupying areas of from one hundred up to several thousand acres each forms a compact whole, producing all it requires. The chief part of the products is destined for direct use by the community itself and does not take the form of a commodity. Hence, production here is independent of that division of labour brought about in Indian society as a whole by means of the exchange of commodities. It is the surplus alone that becomes a commodity, and a portion of even that, not until it has reached the hands of the state, into whose hands, from time immemorial, a certain quantity of these products has found its way in the shape of rent in kind. The constitution of these communities varies in different parts of India. In those of the simplest form, the land is tilled in common, and the produce divided among the members. At the same time, spinning and weaving are carried on in each family as subsidiary industries, Side by side with the masses thus occupied with one and the same work, we find the chief inhabitant, who is judge, police, and tax-gatherer in one, the bookkeeper, who keeps the accounts of the tillage and registers everything relating thereto, another official, 
who prosecutes criminals, protects strangers travelling through, and escorts them to the next village, the boundary man, who guards the boundaries against neighbouring communities, the water overseer, who distributes the water from the common tanks for irrigation, the Brahmin, who conducts the religious services, the schoolmaster, who on the sand teaches the children reading and writing, the calendar Brahmin, or astrologer, who makes known the lucky or unlucky days for seed time and harvest and for every other kind of agricultural work, a smith and a carpenter who make and repair all the agricultural implements, the potter who makes all the pottery of the village, the barber, the washerman who washes clothes, the silversmith, here and there the poet, who in some communities replaces the silversmith, in others the schoolmaster. This dozen of individuals is maintained at the expense of the whole community. If the population increases, a new community is founded, on the pattern of the old one, on unoccupied land. The whole mechanism discloses a systematic division of labour, but a division like that in manufactures is impossible, since the smith and the carpenter, etc., find an unchanging market, and at the most there occur, according to the sizes of the villages, two or three of each, instead of one. Footnote Lieutenant Colonel Mark Wilkes Historical Sketches of the South of India, 1810 A good description of the various forms of the Indian communities is to be found in George Campbell's Modern India, 1852. End of footnote. The law that regulates the division of labour in the community acts with the irresistible authority of a law of nature. At the same time that each individual artificer, the smith, the carpenter, and so on, conducts in his workshop all the operations of his handicraft in the traditional way, but independently, and without recognising any authority over him. The simplicity of the organisation for producing in these self-sufficing communities that constantly reproduce themselves in the same form, and when accidentally destroyed, spring up again, on the spot and with the same name. Footnote under this simple form, the inhabitants of the country have lived from time immemorial. The boundaries of the villages have been but seldom altered, and though the villages themselves have been sometimes injured and even desolated by war, famine, and disease, the same name, the same limits, the same interests, and even the same families have continued for ages. The inhabitants give themselves no trouble about the breaking up and division of kingdoms, while the village remains entire, they care not to what power it is transferred or to what sovereign it devolves. Its internal economy remains unchanged. Thomas Stanford Raffles, the late Lieutenant Governor of Java. The History of Java, 1817. End of footnote. This simplicity supplies the key to the secret of the unchangeableness of Asiatic societies an unchangeableness in such striking contrast with the constant dissolution and refounding of Asiatic states, and the never-ceasing changes of dynasty. The structure of the economic elements of society remains untouched by the storm clouds of the political sky. The rules of the guilds, as I have said before, by limiting most strictly the number of apprentices and journeymen that a single master could employ, prevented him from becoming a capitalist. Moreover, he could not employ his journeymen in many other handicrafts than the one in which he was a master. The guilds zealously repelled every encroachment by the capital of merchants, the only form of free capital with which they came in contact. A merchant could buy every kind of commodity, but labour as a commodity he could not buy. He existed only on sufferance, as a dealer in the products of the handicrafts. If circumstances called for a further division of labour, the existing guilds split themselves up into varieties, or founded new guilds by the side of the old ones. All this, however, without concentrating various handicrafts in a single workshop. Hence, the guild organisation, 
however much it may have contributed by separating, isolating and perfecting the handicrafts to create the material conditions for the existence of manufacture, excluded division of labour in the workshop. On the whole, the labourer and his means of production remained closely united like the snail with its shell, and thus there was wanting the principal basis of manufacture, the separation of the labourer from his means of production and the conversion of these means into capital. While division of labour in society at large, whether such division be brought about or not by exchange of commodities, is common to economic formations of society the most diverse, division of labour in the workshop, as practised by manufacture, is a special creation of the capitalist mode of production alone.